just trying to get used to all of these systems here. Okay, thank you, Herman and Pamela. And once again, Emily. So Pamela and I, in a conversation with Dr. Hallow sometime last summer, began to conceive of a gathering of this sort. And as some of you know, it, it evolved and uh, we're here today. From the beginning, I thought of my role as a little bit of an outsider, I'm not a historian of science, I am an art historian, but not working with materials that you might conceive of as um, being in the category of science. So I've thought of my presentation this afternoon as an overview of the relationship between art and science, and I've pictured it a little bit for you, and the particular significance of metamorphosis from the perspective of those of us who work in the arts. And by that, I mean uh, literature as well as visual imaging, not as a case study of research as I suspect others will be um, presenting. Although you will have a chance, I think in the way I've organized visual material and things, questions that I ask about it to see the way in which um, I operate as an art historian, what kinds of things interest me and how I allow my materials to lead me to questions. Arts display in museums, away from the circumstances for which much of it was made, palaces, churches, domestic residences, and its emergence in the last half century or so as a valued commodity, presents us with an image of art as a product primarily rather than a process. But this was not true, certainly not in the early centuries of our, um, what we traditionally been called the Middle Ages or the Renaissance. And the works that I have studied most closely, which were made in Europe between the 12th and 15th centuries, were not even regarded as art when they were made. Paintings, objects, sculptures had work to do. They informed those who couldn't read, serving as pictorial texts, a, a pictorial a uh, poor man's Bible for those who um, didn't know how to read. They enacted prayers to saints who couldn't be seen but had power to heal. And they were also evidence of identity and authority in the uh, instance of portraits. They provided testimony of wealth, status, or something of the sort. Drawings that survive, and I'll be showing a few of those, were sometimes preparatory sketches for large, uh, larger works, paintings, for example, but there were also forms of inquiry, how to render a hand or an arm, a horse or a plant on paper was a way of understanding how it was constructed and thereby uh, allowing you to replicate it. And of course, contributing to the science, um, uh, to knowledge of uh, how that object or element operated. It wasn't just the end goal uh, to provide aesthetic pleasure. And so when these uh, roles of art are recalled, we recognize that art and science, and really repeating what Herman has said, were not uh, denizens of two separate cultures as they were constructed in the middle of the 12th, uh, 20th century. In fact, metamorphosis, what do I squeeze? This is your new update, there I am. Oh, it's yeah. left or right. Oh. This is left or right, and this is in the back. Of the it's going to be the pointer, right? Okay. In fact, metamorphosis, the subject of investigation here at the IBL, as we know, has since the Middle Ages been central to various object-making enterprises. And all our speakers, I think, will be um, talking about that, even showing some of the same slides. It's the at the heart of image making's understanding of itself as a process of transformation of materials, be they minerals, plant juices, stone, wood, metals, the transformation of those materials into imagery, as well as an attempt to 
replicate the processes of, um, or to understand the, uh, the processes of replication. So we had several copies of the 2000 year old poem, very long poem of Ovid written 10 uh, BCE in the first decade or so we think of our era, starting with the one in the upper left, maybe the earliest one we'll see, which is in Naples of all places once again, a Neapolitan Ovid from the 11th to 13th century, in which pictures and images is a constant in all of these. Pictures are companions to text, they're not alternatives, they're not even illustrations. There's alternate ways of understanding the message that comes through in words. And that's certainly true in the one in the lower right from the 1930s, I believe, which is uh, by Picasso. Other ones going in counterclockwise direction, an Italian, one of the earliest translations at the lower left of into Italian of Ovid from Venice in 1497, a mid 16th century, um, uh, example of um, uh, the poem going up to the upper right translations into English, which you get in the 17th, 16th and 17th century, and then coming around to the 20th century. Some have called Ovid the father of philosophical secrets, seeing his myths as a hidden language of alchemy in which gods work occult powers with the natural world hiding them under the wrap of fables. And indeed, various common metals were known by the name of, of presiding gods. So gold was called Apollo, mercury, quicksilver, uh, iron and copper, Mars and Venus. And again, we may be hearing more, I would think about this later on. So the poem by some throughout the ages, especially in the later Middle Ages and uh, early modern period was construed as an chemical allegory, not just a story of um, uh, a mythology of warring gods. Oh. There we are. Okay, I've got it now. So we have the first page of, I think it's the, um, one of the translations of the poem in the middle, pointing to the line, the first line of the text of bodies change to other shapes I sing. And that is kind of the motto of what you do in the laboratory as well as the poets and the artists were thinking that they were doing um, as well. It's the first line of Ovid's poem, as I say, about 2000 years old uh, and containing endless books and oh, 250 or so different stories of transformation, humans to animal, humans to plant, uh, colors transforming. All of these are part of very well-known myths for you. At the upper left is a painting we'll be looking at again, a relatively small panel, size of a tablet by Piero Palaiuolo from about 1470 of the transformation of Daphne into a laurel tree. Uh, she's trying to escape pursuit by Apollo and cries out to be saved from his grasp. And indeed, um, the, their movement is arrested and she becomes implanted as a tree. We'll look at uh, that more closely and we'll think about it, I hope, in other sorts of ways. An interesting point to know here is that Piero Palaiolo uh, had a brother named Antonio who was a metal worker. And uh, there is confusion sometimes as to who did what, but most of this painting, which is in the National Gallery in London, is mostly attributed now to the painter brother, Piero, who also trained in a shop of distinguished artists in the 15th century in Italy, and his brother Antonio uh, being responsible for metalwork, small castings of sculptures of Hercules and the like, which again may come into um, discussion subsequently. These are uh, just close-ups of the books to give you a sense of uh, the luxury of any of these manuscripts. They're uh, models of profusion. The one at the left, the early Venetian, the early um, uh, printed book, which you see at the left. I just draw your attention to the typeface, to the descriptive or the story image 
and then the grotesques that are in the frame. These are all different ways of expressing ideas, values, and um, um, I think that once again, that differentiation among words, among images, uh, transcriptions of reality, and also hybrid inventions. These are re uh, actually rhetorical categories that were used at the time, but these are um, issues that I think will come through in various papers we'll be hearing. One of the best known myths, I think, to almost everybody is that of Narcissus, which you see in a very big tapestry, perhaps the size of what you see on the screen in the Boston Museum about 1500, and a tiny panel in England, which is probably only the size of the folded sheet of paper that I'm holding. Uh, and um, one problem in lectures or presentations of this sort is that uh, sizes get distorted radically. And I do want you to appreciate that one is tiny. Uh, what would it, this would have been in a um, somebody's library, maybe just a little panel to be looked at from time to time, held in the drawer, not even hung on a wall. And the tapestry would obviously serve another kind of purpose. And the story of Narcissus, which you see here, which he sees his reflection in a pool, falls in love with his reflection and has a bad outcome. And that's the origin of the narcissistic personality. And it's most exquisitely rendered in this painting, a little beyond the time I'm talking about, by Caravaggio, painting in the Palazzo Barberini in Rome from about 1600. And I accompanied with a, a, a quote from 1420s or 30s by Alberti, a theorist of painting in, in Italy. The inventor of painting was Narcissus because he attempted to capture the image that which was his own reflection that he saw in the pool. And this is one of the generative myths of painting. Where did painting come from? It is likened at least to Narcissus's attempt to capture his image. Ovid's stories were the subject of fascination for many artists because it's a story about the origin of painting. It's a story also of mythical transformations, metamorphoses, which uh, are what artists are also engaged in and art makers. And it particularly um, engaged uh, the artist Titian, who was commissioned to do a series of painting for the emperor of uh, the Habsburg Emperor of Europe, Philip II, in about 1550. And he chose stories from all that they happened to be all about rape or abduction. We'll set aside that issue of power and struggle it's, uh, for now and try to look at another aspect of what's happening uh, in the image. Uh, but that was, uh, I think we could say, one of the reasons that Philip uh, agreed to have this theme of scenes of induction of mythical power of the gods over the universe uh, to decorate one of his private rooms in his palace. And this is a detail of perhaps the most beautiful of all of those uh, six or eight paintings uh, recently exhibited in uh, a show in Boston. And you see um, the at the Garden Museum, and perhaps some of you saw that exhibition. I, I know some did. And this is the uh, an image of the recently cleaned Rape of Europa being carefully moved into place by the uh, technical squad, the preparators. Uh, of the museum. And I like the, I'm glad to have found this online because it reminds us that these pictures are objects. They have material bulk to them. They're not just things on a wall that kind of are totally two dimensional. They really have a material presence. And it's um, understanding that aspect of art that allows us or is a point of entry for thinking about art in a more, let's say, material way and not just in a pictorial way. So uh, let's go back as, uh, and look at the background of the picture because I want to bring out another aspect of the picture in which um, metamorphosis may be thought to play a part. If we concentrate on the sky around Europa who is being pulled away by this bull from her handmaidens, her friends on the beach, he of course is in um, transformation of the god himself. So the essence of metamorphosis is really encapsulated by the two figures. 
And we look at that sky with its cloudy sunset, the Venetian lagoon with all those colors. Well, the blues look good, but the rest of it looks a little brown. And we see um, a fresher view. Sometimes slides distort colors. I'm very conscious of that. But here's a detail taken of the cleaned painting. And I'll just read from a, uh, in fact, from the catalog's description of what you see. Titian cleverly envisioned a sky in transition from clear blue to cloudy gray. Scientific analysis demonstrated that it contains two different blue pigments. Ultramarine delivers the brilliant azure visible on the left, an extremely stable but also very expensive pigment based on the mineral lapis lazuli, which was imported to Venice from Afghanistan. We can open up a conversation about cultural exchange and the sourcing of materials. I mean, that's a direction to go, but, but we're not. Smalt, which is a um, mixture of glass and cobalt chloride and uh, other um, pigments, is an unstable pigment, changing color over time and it resulting in a more muted hue. The dark, this is a result of the conservation discoveries by the conservators of the painting at the time of its cleaning for the exhibition. The dark gray brown at the right is a result of its decomposition. So there is a kind of reverse transformation in a way, a regression you might say in the pigment, but a change in what the artist himself expected. This original, the area of uh, sort of uh, brownish or grayish, and you can see how thinly painted it is on the canvas. This area would have appeared more silvery in uh, the original appropriate to the wispy clouds. So the painting itself is a place because of the materials that are employed in which transformation colors lose their brilliance um, and other uh, um, uh, alterations actually uh, occur in the surface of paintings. So let's go back to that painting by Palewolo of Apollo and Daphne. And what you see here is a, uh, which I grabbed off the internet, is a typical, I think, kind of textbook art history um, uh, question for, or page for students in an art history class, all of which really refer to the text. You know, what is the story? How is it different from Ovid? Um, what happens when you have to try to show a text visually? The reference is always to the text itself, uh, what it says and other ways in which you might actually show it. And in thinking about this and thinking about our conference and thinking, in fact, about the wonderful um, pamphlet that um, Emily drew up and parts of which Dr. Haller has already shown us about a tree and a tree with branches, I went looking not only for a bay or laurel tree, not easy to find, which you see on the right uh, hand screen, just to give you an idea of, in fact, the density, the clumps of leaves and the way they grow, uh, perhaps the way in which the branches separate from a single stem, although most trees have that, but really that clumping of leaves and berries. And I thought to myself, well, why don't more people, in looking at the painting in the middle, think about what kind of um, images of natural um, bodies, of trees, of bushes, of plants, might have been av available in the 15th century, and talk more about the way in which Polaiwolo has rendered the tree and perceived the tree, and what his source of knowledge might be, and whether he's adding anything to it. And at the left, you have a page um, that Pamela certainly knows well from something called the Edgerton, an Edgerton, the Carrara herbal, an exquisite manuscript from London made about 1400 with a long story of why it was made and for whom it was made. This is not a laurel tree at the left, but it renders extraordinary images of plants, peppermint at the left, violets at the right that are perceived as they grow, the leaf. So what you have is um, a rendering that almost shows you the process of growth from the little roots all the way up the stems, smaller leaves, larger leaves, tendrils, the whole process is being rendered. It's not just a description of what you might see in any end state or fine, finite state. 
And that I, I think is a way in which I, if I were to look further at this and um, try to think about Polaiolo's work here, undoubtedly the um, copper green or the pigments that were used have, I don't know why I want to say ossified, they've trans, uh, changed over time so that it is dense and you can't really see what it looks like. I don't know if the National Gallery in London has done uh, uh, any uh, radiography on the painting to determine what, um, uh, what they might see in underdrawing. I'll get to that in another minute. But that is something I would be really interested to think about in this painting. How do, might it relate to some of the nature drawings of Colvin Simply that we know were, um, existed in the Italian peninsula three quarters of a century before Polaiolo worked, as attested to, for example, by the Carrara Herbal. And another um, sensational, really exquisite example of the same legend, a uh, century, a little more, two centuries, well, something about 1600 by uh, Don Lorenzo Bernini, is this sculpture 1625 is the date usually given for it uh, of Apollo chasing Daphne. Again, she's turning into a tree, but here what he has turned his attention to is the transformation of material. And so you see, he is looking at how do you suddenly make marble flesh on the one hand and then hair and then leaves. Do you see it again? In the roots on the right, he shows you bark, he shows you toes, he gives you the sense of almost a, um, the marble is growing into the toenails and becoming the roots. And at the left, you have an eccentric view of, that is to say, an unusual kind of uh, perspective on the sculpture, which gives you that sense of movement, of transformation, of pursuit, of something even violent in nature, which is fundamentally at the heart of the poetic concept of metamorphosis. I don't know who the woman on the cell phone is, but this is not my picture. And so we come to where we are, and there's um, the wonderful um, program of our um, gathering with this wonderful illustration from uh, the Edgerton, I'm sorry, the Queen Mary Psalter, as um, attributed appropriately. And I show you a detail of what we call a bas de page, a little bottom of the manuscript page on the right, which actually illustrates the lives of animals. And this one, I think it's a hedgehog or something of that sort. And again, the uh, statement from Einstein in the upper, upper right, that once again, a tree with two branches. And suddenly now this Apollo and Daphne picture is looking maybe um, a little different to us. We're beginning to think a little differently about it. And it occurred to me when I was looking at this tree with two branches and the way in which Einstein used it, and I obviously pulled that also off the uh, internet, that there is something called Leonardo's rule. Because Leonardo da Vinci, whom we see in the center, and perhaps was even before the 16th century artist whose work Herman showed us, was absolutely the um, icon of artist and scientist. He was an engineer, he did fortifications, hydraulics, he invented flying machines, didn't always work, but he was a keen observer of nature. And he observed that all the branches of a tree at every stage of its height, when put together are equal in thickness to the trunk. If a tree branches, if a tree's branches were folded upward and squeezed together, the tree would look like one big trunk with the same thickness from top to bottom. Tree, that's, that's an explanation of what he wrote. Trees are fractal in nature, meaning the patterns created by the large structures repeat themselves in the smaller structures. Now, Leonardo didn't know why this was so for trees, but a physicist, someone named Christophe Lois from Aix Marseille University in Provence, attempted to find out designing trees on a computer with intricate branching patterns and then subjecting them to various wind forces. Show, and uh, as a result of that work, he showed that the diameters for each branch limited the chance of snapping. 
rep, uh, replicating uh, Leonardo's rule. It seems from what I've read that I think you show this for maple and oak trees because trees have so many branches, even on a computer, it's pretty daunting to get all of those mapped into your um, diagram or your system that you want to test. This seems to um, lend the credibility to the argument, which had previously been untested, that it is a structural aspect of the tree's development and not a hydrological one, which has to do with the um, transportation of sap through the tree's vessels that accounts for the way in which the tree uh, organi is organized. And uh, one of the thoughts is that, it, that wind acts on the tree as it is growing to affect uh, this patternization. So using Leonardo and his one foot, not just a tree branch in his place, but Leonardo has kind of one hand or the same hand, a left hand in art and in science. I really arrived at the way in which I wanted to have us think, or I wanted to share with you the way in which um, I like to think about the relationship between art and science. And it's a distinct and. The two are they're not just meeting each other, they are intertwined. There really is not, certainly in the period I look at, there is not a separation between them. And at the left, you see, of course, I don't have to tell you who she is, but she's really Lisa Gerardini. She has a name uh, from which Mona Lisa, kind of her nickname came. 1503, I think she was started, but never finished. Uh, taken with Leonardo from Florence to France, the Loire Valley, where he died in 1519 and left there. So it is now the crown jewel, we might say, of the Louvre Museum. And at the right, uh, one of Leonardo's scientific drawings, uh, pictured as a postage stamp for the celebration of the uh, 500th anniversary of his death in 2019. And it's on uh, these incredible drawings from a huge volume of uh, scientific drawings are the property of the Queen of England, whose little silhouette you see in the upper right. And as a birthday present, in a sense, to uh, the English nation on the occasion of this great anniversary for Leonardo, many of these drawings were sent to different regional museums in England uh, so that the entire people everywhere, not just in London, could enjoy uh, Leonardo's uh, creativity. I don't know what I'm doing. Well, oh, I'm leaning on something. I'm sorry. Can we have any assistance here? Maybe it's that I'm still not. He's doing. I just want to get this out of the way. I'm not even. What I'm hoping to do is to try to uh, review quite a number of images to get us to think how art how image making um, implicates, implies scientific uh, inquiry, invention, inquiry and invention really going hand in hand. And we'll use Leonardo as our first example and then move into Jan van Eyck um, and some of his 
colleagues in Netherlands in the 16th, 15th century before ending with a question that I come upon as a result of trying to really explore thinking of art and science together. Okay, I will be very. I see that the ampersound fell out of that title. There we go. Okay. Okay, let's, I will just keep my finger in one place. Well, my, obviously, um, I, I don't want to overstep the bounds of the time limit. What Leonardo has done in this drawing is to try to show you how water flows. This is just to understand the depths of his um, inquisitiveness, his curiosity about what makes things happen. He doesn't just paint water. He wants to understand the flow of the water so that he can um, render it with that understanding. And um, he writes with his backward hand, actually there's an ex explanation he gives you, I won't go into the whole detail, but um, he, uh, he looks at the bubbles and he understands that which ones lose air sooner than the others, the deeper ones retain it. And he says that has to do because of uh, water's weight in air as opposed to what happens to those bubbles when they're in the water. This just uh, gives you some sense of the degree to which these drawings are inquiries into processes. They're not aesthetic products. And he uh, does it again with a representation of a hand. And that really for me is the signal one. Is it the right or the left hand? He himself was left-handed. He also talks about where all the tendons and the muscles and the joints are. And even in the skull, which is one of the drawings from this manuscript, he replicates the inside of the skull as well as the out. He takes the teeth out and puts them at the side and shows you what the pockets or hollows in the skull might look like. These are all ways of really understanding these 
uh, phenomena that he's looking at. Skulls were parts of paintings at the time. They were meditations on, on death. For example, St. Jerome has is shown with skulls. So these are inquiries that might lead to something in his paintings, but they're really done for the um, scientific, we would call it knowledge that he's acquiring. And certainly his studies of hands uh, are formative or fundamental for his representation of gestures and paintings. I have a collage of them in the upper right and in the lower right, the hands of the Mona Lisa. Some had seen the little bump on her right hand above her thumb as a manifestation of some kind of sickness or illness or disturbance to um, her, her body. I wanna take hands in another direction and look at the role that hands play as, um, as involved in manual labor in a variety of late uh, medieval things you see from the 12th century, the 13th century, and ultimately early the 15th century. Adam is a toiler and the work of his hands Contrary to theological arguments that uh, manual labor was his condemnation, there is a tradition, uh, less well discussed perhaps by church theologians, of manual labor being a virtue, being God's gift to humanity to be able to labor with their own hands. And that I really argue in uh, something I wrote a while ago is what we see in Jan Van Eyck's painting at the right. That, uh, uh, it's a little exaggerated in the slide to be sure, but the discoloration of the hand, what we might call a roughening of texture because it's um, you know, been exposed to the wind and the rain or perhaps a sunburn is a manifestation of the role that hand plays in the labor and work of, man of mankind. The painting from which that comes at the upper uh, left here is uh, the great Ghent altarpiece dated about 1432, just to give you an idea of its range. And what might strike you is there are two really uh, seriously undressed people here in this uh, um, panoply otherwise of incredible textures and garments. And that has always kind of been a fascination now for me, perhaps the skin is their costume, their garment. Uh, a celebration of the garment of nudity, really, as a celebration of humanity's own skin. But we see even here that his hands, and a uh, lightning slide, his hands are clearly brightened. Uh, they seem to be reflecting some effect of the sun. And actually, if you look at Eve, we might notice that she also has the mark of pigmentation or discoloration on her uh, belly. Uh, the uh, slide all the way here at the left shows you that it's not only the suntan, but it's also the discovery of veins underneath that um, uh, Van Eyck, Jan Van Eyck, we believe in this case, is uh, focusing on in his rendering. And a close up, if you can get your head around, this is the right arm that's crossing his body to show you the extraordinary details of hairs. Uh, this is crackling in the actual paint surface. It's not from his brush. But what I think we see here too is that he's fascinated with light, the effects of light, light cutting through glazes, light creating um, uh, highlights as well as shadows. And of course, light ultimately is what creates changes in pigmentation in the skin. And so this rendering of Adam with these, this, these discolored hands is an extraordinary observation of the way in which skin tones change color in the presence of sunlight. Again, a, a, an inquiry, not just a rendering of an effect. The painting itself, and I'll just uh, try to conclude with this, the painting itself has been rendered recently for the last 10 years to incredible scientific observation and cleaning this is the outside wings, and you can see from left to right a series of cleanings, which gets rid of varnishes and overpaintings and results in what you see at the right. The interior has not yet been fully cleaned, and I'm very eager to see what the Adam and Eve will look like when some of those varnishes come off. The entire process is online. Uh, somewhere I have actually a link to that, and you can uh, track it visually, and uh, there's documentation about what the findings were. So when visitors came to the, uh, the church, 
a San Pablo in Ghent, where the painting has long been the prize attraction, visitors were able to see it undergoing restoration. And a ectochrome simulation of the painting was on view in the um, gallery or the chapel where the painting usually stood. These are other details. I thought there would be of some interest to people here at the lab whose own use of an extraordinarily electronic um, technology to investigate uh, their materials is comparable in many ways to the kind of materials we have here. Uh, this, uh, uh, this is some, this to explain, this is the, the explanation of the web side of, of what you actually see when you um, cut through a kind of imaginary slice of the panel. So you're seeing all the different layers. And what they're explaining is that there are different kind of radiographic investigations cut through these different layers and allow them to make determinations. These are the different kinds of uh, uh, radiographic treatments that the panels have been subjected to. And I just leave it to um, all of you to see the different layers, which again go through different layers of pigment and varnish. I'm responsible for having um, emphasized the very last uh, part of this uh, diagram or this, or this um, table because I was interested in the acknowledgement that it is Adobe Photoshop uh, uh, software that ultimately allows them to aggregate and make comprehensible the uh, imagery. The mass, the central focus of this gigantic multi-paneled altarpiece is a panel with the Lamb of God. And you see someone restoring very carefully uh, that element. And what was discovered in its, um, as they did their research, you see before treatment, what the lamb looked like. And this caused a great stir because front page in the New York Times, among other papers, you see that his ears got shifted, the eyes got shifted, kind of looks almost more like a human face. What happened was that the uh, restorers were taking off a lot of old varnish and also a lot of paint. And there's still uncertainty uh, as to what, when that paint was put on. But what interested me, was how they are showing you where the gold is, where the copper is, where the mercury is. They are showing you in the process of their investigations where these um, mineral materials, parts of the pigment were incorporated into the representation of the lab. I'll try to close with this because I don't want to run over. And I just want to point out that painters got their pigments in the 15th century from natural materials, and they were, um, which could be purchased at pharmacies, which put them in contact with uh, physicians or let's call them health workers. And they also had assistants in the um, studios in which they were, who would be grinding the pigments for them. And in these two paintings, again, one a very tiny one from uh, an early 15th century manuscript concerning famous women. We see Marcia painting, uh, a picture of the Virgin, which is a trope at the time, but we see someone assisting her in the grinding of all things of that luxurious blue pigment. And another painting from about a century later by a Swiss artist, not uh, widely known, we see a representation of Saint Luke, the gospel writer who was called a physician in one of the epistles, so it's biblical texts that are still um, ascribing the power to heal to the same individual who can write. And by the 8th century, he's also seen as a painter. So St. Luke, by the 15th or 16th century, is shown often in the guise of a physician painting a picture of the virgin, virgin accompanied by all his tools. But in this particular image, also by someone grinding his materials, so it becomes an image of a collaboration. The artist is working in a system with other people who supply him with materials and uh, fortify or develop them for him. In addition to what he brings uh, himself really as a transformer of those pigments into images. I think two last slides. This is a... Um, Byzantine image a Greek, uh, from the Eastern church, uh, the tradition of painting on gold ground. 
And what you see is St. Luke painting this holy image that Theotokos believed to be a, a vision of the Virgin as mother of Christ. And it is one of the most um, important icons actually in the Eastern Orthodox Church. And he is painting this from his imagination. So is the artist at the left, whom we see here painting that same picture. You see here what is thought to be or said to be one of the most venerable examples of that icon thought in Moscow. And at the right, you have a successor to Jan van Eyck in the Netherlands, the lowlands in the middle of the 15th century, showing you St. Luke also painting a picture of the Virgin. But what he is doing now is painting from nature. He's not imagining what the Virgin looked like or making it up from his head. He is in a very detailed way painting what he sees. And there are two examples I show you. This is the detail of the Boston painting. This is a copy of the Boston painting, but a very um, uh, high quality painting, let's call it, which just shows you the way in which that face comes out on the uh, paper uh, more sharply. And what we observe is that he's not using a pencil. He's using a silver or a metal stick, which produces a very particular kind of painting called a silver drawing, called a silver point drawing. And the um, kind of magical quality about silver point drawings is that you need to work on a prepared paper, paper that has been washed with a layer of something like chalk. And then when you scratch it with your silver point, the lines appear come into being because of oxidation. So the drawing itself, and I'll end here rather than um, go on to the question I wanted to ask, maybe we'll have another chance for that, is just to suggest to, we, to you, not only the way in which art, especially in the 15th and early 16th century in the hands of the old masters, is a collaborative aspect. It involves uh, many people working together and it also is a part of discovery and an appreciation of the transformative powers that are both in texts as in the metamorphosis, as well as in the art that gets produced. Sorry for the glitch and um, sorry to have run over, but uh, I think we'll move on. And let me, uh, 